speaking of uh, the unseen world and how you relate to it, that was uh, a new experience to move into an African town where all of our neighbors believed in spirits and had various ways of dealing with the spirit world and was one of the things that made Islam more popular than Christianity because the Western Christian missionaries did not believe in the spirit world. The Muslims did, and they said, well, the, in the power of Allah and the Prophet, we can protect you from the spirits. So, uh, one of the things we slowly learned to do was present the gospel as the power of God, not only unto salvation, but over the spirits who trouble us. And those who tried him out found yes, indeed. So thereafter, we found that nearly everyone who came to faith in Christ did so partly because they were looking for protection from the powers of evil. So if you're dealing with those from overseas or from another culture, from another religion, that's one of the things they have in the back of their mind, but they might not tell you or me about it because they know we do not believe. So, here we are. Reversing Hermon. Herman is a man's name. <laughs> uh, the sons of God and the Nephilim. We are the 29th of September. All right, what's going on here? Well, in any Bible study group, we have objectives or goals. And this morning, I have four of them. First, I hope that we shall be able to identify the so-called sons of God. Secondly, to describe the Nephilim in their own Mesopotamian context. That is, let's let antiquity determine who they are rather than our imagination or the footnotes in some Bible. Thirdly, define Second Temple Judaism. We'll do it right now. The period between, let's say, 500 BC until the destruction of the Jerusalem Temple in AD 70. And then I hope that we'll be able to adopt or include a supernatural, supernatural biblical worldview. That world term worldview is several meanings in the popular culture, but we mean the way people look at their world, how they believe it operates. Right, what's going on here? Those look like the good looking daughters of men. Also, that, all that orange stuff up there at the top, we'll assume that those are... Sons of God looking down on us. Yeah. Attractive women. Mm -hmm. So, now I don't know what was wrong with the daughters of the gods, but anyway. Will someone read for us Genesis 6, 1 through 4. When people began to multiply on the face of the ground, the daughters were born to them. The sons of God saw that they were fair, and they took wives for themselves of all that they chose. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God went into the daughters of humans who bore children to them. These were the heroes that were of old warriors of renown. Right. Any question about this text? There shouldn't be. <laughs> uh, let's go to chapter. Let's go to verse five. <laughs> well, no. I was noticing it says the Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward. Uh, because I know that there are some of these Nephilim after the flood. Which you think they all get wiped out? So is that is that what that's referring to afterward, or any ideas on what the afterward is? That's the way most folk take it, before the flood and after the flood. Uh, so the writer were anticipating uh, an explanation of where the very tall, strong Canaanite clans or tribes came from. 
it's kind of like people would think, well, they, they wouldn't do what they were doing before, but why wouldn't they? Uh -huh. if, if, if they had the power to do it before, why wouldn't they have the power after? Okay, good question. Um, you have to deal, though, with the fact that these sons of God are going to be damned to hell and kept there. So it would have to be somebody else who did it. Um, anyway, we're going to come back around to most of the elements of these verses. But they saw that they were fair or beautiful, which the Hebrew term tov is the most general possible word for good. Nice, pretty, useful. And so I'm wondering if they were considered these women useful for something more than sensually desirable. That is to say, their objective was not just to have more fun, but rather to gain rulership over the entire earth. All right, uh, some questions have come up, including yours. Uh, who are the sons of God, or what? Are they divine, that is supernatural, or are they human beings? After all, they mated with human women. And who were the Nephilim? And how were their Nephilim after the flood? By the by, why do they translate it Nephilim? That's a trick question. Is it a transliteration? It is. It's not a translation. Bible translators over the centuries have often done that. When they did not know what something meant, or politically it could have costed them their head if they translated it, they just used the Hebrew word or the Greek word. For example, baptism. That's not an English word, it's a Greek word. That being so. That's where the Baptists get all messed up. <laughs> Bapto means to dip. Baptizo means to dip eyes, therefore it's a special meaning. Well, the Sons of Seth interpretation is one of the current evangelical definitions of who were the sons of God. Uh, here's the hypothesis. Seth's godly male descendants married Cain's godless female descendants. Now, is that what the Hebrews believed? There's no evidence that any Hebrew ever believed that in the thousands of years of Old Testament uh, scripture. Where did it come from? Wasn't that something that was adopted in the fourth century? Yes. By the, by, by the churches and the church leaders in the fourth century? Yes, especially Amen. under the influence of the famous theologian, Ach du lieber Augustine. Uh, who made up a lot of stuff that has become standard Roman Catholic theology and adopted by many Protestants and absorbed by evangelicals to this day. For example, original sin. All right, formulated in or about the fourth century AD, appealing to one text in Genesis 4:26, which said, then they began to call on the name of the Lord, the name of Yahweh. Well, who are they? Well, your Bible translation will say something like men or human beings. The pronoun in the Hebrew is actually a singular. He began. But they're just assuming that either the Hebrew scribes made a mistake in copying or the singular pronoun meant something like humanity or mankind. But if you take he to mean Seth, then you get this idea that Seth's lineage be over all godly. At least the men. Nothing is said about the women. And that the other children of Adam, and he had many sons and daughters, they did not begin calling upon the name of the Lord, so they were all godless, or at least their women were godless. Does that sound logical to you? Logical. No, but if you're hard up for an anti-supernatural explanation of the sons of God, it's about all you have left. 
you would, you would think that uh, if that were the case, Seth will call it on the name of the Lord, that uh, Seth would exhibit benefits for having done so, and the other people would want those benefits. Right, and uh, as we're going to see, we don't even have to... Uh, yes, that's logical. All right. This ex this theory, this hypothesis, however, does not explain the Nephilim. When our adult Christian children married non-Christians, how did their children turn out? Some of them may have been little monsters, but uh, they were entirely human. They were not Nephilim. Okay. Just to clarify, the Nephilim are, are the uh, product of the sons of God and, and human women. Exactly, oh. yes. Sons of God, Mary, and half breeds. Or making with <laughs> half breeds. Hmm. <laughs> Which half was bred? Or, and neither Seth nor Cain is named in the entire account. So it's a question of importing into the text something it never said. <laughs> And likewise, in the Old Testament, human beings were never called sons of God. No place. Got out my concordance and looked it up. Oh, and by the way, we are told very specifically that these were daughters of humankind, not daughters only of Cain. Why, one of the questions, why were the women willing to bear children to these other beings? Way, perhaps well, they know they were other people. Uh, they probably didn't know, or they had no choice. No choice, possibly. Or they wanted superhuman children, or they want these sons of God were richer, more powerful, more handsome, and most women prefer strong men. Did these other beings just look human? If they, if they were part of the uh, heavenly host at one time, then whatever they do, about anything, or they just were able to adapt a human-like form that people were... Yeah, that's an intelligent question. First thing that comes to my mind is that all in all of Scripture, every angel that appeared to us humans took a human form. In fact, they're often called men. A man appeared to Jacob, and they wrestled through the night. Yeah, okay. So let's just, I think we can safely assume so until other evidence comes up. Now there's a second interpretation as to who were these sons of God, and that these were divinized human kings. What does divinized mean? Made to be divine, or declared to be divine, or just believed to be some kind of god. <coughs> so, for example, the pharaohs of Egypt were believed to be human gods. So the, the hypothesis states that in Psalm 82.6, God calls human men gods, who then sinned by committing polygamy. What do you think? That makes sense. Psalm 82, 6 says, I said you are gods. Well, whom did God say that to? He was saying that to his divine counsel. Of course, we know that. Yeah. But if you go back to 100 years, uh, when anti-supernatural thought, reason, was entering into Protestantism, they didn't like the idea of spirit beings, so they declared those to be government authorities kings of some kind, and that the sin must have been polygamy was a big question. Will we allow polygamy in our United States laws or not? Because there was a religious movement coming up that was practicing polygamy. In fact, there were more than one. One of them survives to this day. Difficulties with this position. First, uh, well, pagans believed their kings to be divine, or at least they divinized them by declaring them to be gods. However, the passage says nothing about polygamy. 
In fact, polygamy is not condemned in the Hebrew Bible. On the contrary, some of the most godly old men whom we idealize were polygamists. Oh, um, David. For example. For example, had, had a bunch of wives and, and uh, concubines on top of that. That's right. And so what happened when American Protestant missionaries went to Africa and found polygamy, they refused to baptize any African who wanted to become a Christian if he was polygamous. And but that creates a question, which of the women do you throw out in the street? Yeah. <laughs> or what typically happened was, all right, I give permission for my wives and my children to be Christians. I will just go to hell. Well, uh, since then, what the African churches have largely done is said, we're Christians, our churches do not allow polygamy. If you become poly I talked to a famous Christian leader once, he's gone to be with the Lord now, about this question, and uh, his reply was that you cannot love more than one woman. And so we, our churches have disallowed polygamy, but God commands us to baptize those who put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So we Christian churches, we will baptize the believing polygamists. But he's to take no more wives. All right? Others observe that this phrase, sons of God, which appears several times in the Hebrew Bible, is only used of divine beings. Now when I say divine, I don't mean God. I mean a spirit being who is something more than human. So, where did this theory come from? It's basically rationalism, the anti-supernatural bias of Western Christians who will allow God, Jesus, angels, devil, and demons, but nothing more. Because those you can conveniently put away in the heavens and you don't have to deal with them. Therefore, you can be entirely rationalist and scientific regarding everything on earth. Remember, though, that we human believers, we will one day be divinized as Jesus was at his resurrection. That is, his body was divinized. He himself was already divine. All right, let's read another passage from the New Testament that talks about these same beings. Now, notice what I just did. I prejudiced you. <laughs> so, when, uh, verse 4. God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell, and committed them to chains of deepest darkness to be kept until the judgment. Right. Now, when it says the angels, now, that passage did not, Genesis 6 did not say angels in Hebrew. But when it was translated into Greek, we used that term, some document. And so this became the New Testament practice to use the general term angels to refer to any divine being, whether it was an angel or not. <clears throat> As another one of those Greek words that was never translated. They could have said fairy, uh, elf. sprite, <laughs> elf. Elf, yeah, we had different words in our language, but we note that angels in Biblical Greek is a general catchword for different kinds of divine beings. But we are assuming here that Peter was referring to Genesis chapter 6, because all of the 1st century, 2nd century, and 3rd century commentators said that's what he was referring to. The, both the Jewish community and the growing Gentiles communities agree. And the context in 1 Peter was, again, the Great Flood, which is the same context as Genesis 6 and 7, in addition to the Mesopotamian mythology of the period. When it says he put them into hell, it says he tartarized them. That is, put them into Tartarus, which in the Greek mythology referred to where the Greek titans the giants were sent, and we'll talk about giants shortly. What we're doing is trying to get a hold on the cultural linguistic context of the passage. Well, Jude, in his little epistle, likewise had something to say about these, and Americans would say, these dudes from heaven. Someone else, verse 6. And the angels who did not keep their own position, but deserted their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains in deepest darkness 
for the judgment of the great day. All right. Any question or comment? A little bit, a little bit different than Peter. The angels who sin versus angels who are in position are their own tears. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, uh, if, but if they are talking about the same beings and the same event, then the sin was to leave their own position and to come down and assume a human position. I kind of wonder if uh, eternal chains, I, yeah. I kind of, angels or divine beings were not allowed to return to heaven. They were yes. They were stuck down there. Wherever the sons of God were, well, they, they've been sent down into hell. And here the, it's called the deepest darkness. Well, first, let's look at the term position. The Greek term is arche, which can mean a position of authority. And interestingly, when Paul talks about the divine beings who rule over the world in our age, one of the terms is arche. So there are still are sons of God in the heavens, but not the ones who sinned in Genesis 6. All right, when he says they deserted, <coughs> There is no other angelic rebellion recorded in the Bible than the one in Genesis 6. Now, go back 150, 200 years ago, our predecessors imagined that there was a previous angelic rebellion which, to, in order to explain the fall of Satan and to explain the chaotic condition of the world uh, mentioned in Genesis 1. It was called the gap theory and they imagined all kinds of things that happened in that gap before verses 1 and 2 of Genesis 1. I myself have looked at it and found it's only about an eighth of an inch. All right, what day? What was the great day? Well, we, in scripture this usually refers to the end of the current age when after Jesus shall have returned. All right, we mentioned several times now Mesopotamia and the, the cultural context in which Genesis 6 was written. So we're talking about the two Mesopotamia between the rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates, and the countries around them, and the great empires that are mentioned in the Bible. So, the Bible writer's theology, where did, we're assuming Moses and Micah, Elijah, and David, where did they get their ideas from? Were they all sitting down at their desk with a blank piece of parchment and a pen already? God, what do you want to say? And he began dictating to them ancient history. Uh, that's what would the standard answer be that came from God? Whether or not in that format, but God told them what to write. Well, I suppose everything came from God. Inspired. They, like the whole world, before we learned how to write, everything was transmitted orally. Mm -hmm. So they were retelling these stories yeah. that they, they came to them through oral transmission over the centuries. Okay, uh, I, we can say just as the New Testament writers included a lot of material from the current beliefs and political and social systems in which they live, it's just as likely that the Old Testament authors also picked up many, if not most, of their ideas from the culture around them. And so we're going to suggest that they adopted the supernatural Mesopotamian worldview. They believed what the Mesopotamians believed, but there was a big difference. That all the other nations had their own gods, <laughs> and respected the gods of the other nations. Whereas the Hebrews, they believed in Yahweh, and they did not respect the god, other gods of the nations. But Yahweh did indeed reveal to them many of his words. He spoke to the prophets. He led the prophets. He gave them visions, and they wrote these things down for us. So we want to emphasize, however, that their theology, that is their beliefs, did not derive from the early churches in the 2nd to the 15th centuries AD. Why could I say that? How could I say that Genesis did not get its ideas from the Christians? Created. Yeah, the Old Testament was written hundreds of years before there was a Christian movement. They were predictive. Okay. Uh, nor from Luther, nor Calvin, 
nor Armenius, nor Wesley. <clears throat> Why could I say that? Well, these all guys all came a thousand years later. And so, if we want to understand the Bible, we have to go to... Rick Warren. <laughs> right. Now, nor does it come from dispensationalism, dispensationalism, which was the majority belief of North American evangelicals until late into the 20th century. However, that was invented with its seven-year tribulation and its uh, pre-trib rapture and all that all was invented in the 19th century. Nor from Pentecostalism, which is an American 20th century invention. Nor from general evangelicalism, which dates from about the mid 20th century as a reaction against the main denominations who were adopting German rationalism and redefining the gospel as a uh, social do-goodism. All right, let's turn now and look at the Nephilim while we still have time. I ask a question just because it sounds a little dangerous. When we say that the Bible writer's theology came from supernatural Mesopotamian worldview and Yahweh's God's own revealed words, we're not going with a uh, kind of liberal understanding that some of the words of the Old Testament are, are from God and that others are extra stuff that may or may not be true because it came from a different culture, kind of a mixed bag thing, so we got kind of so, people here. When we read in the Psalms that Yahweh fought and got the victory over the chaos monster, what was the chaos monster? Well, that's, that's from Mesopotamia. So that's a mixture. The Old Testament uses Mesopotamian language, beliefs, and imagery to reveal truth about Yahweh. And we just have to get used to that. The, you know, that's, and so rather than say, well, no, we don't believe that there was any such thing, we do believe that the Bible spoke to the culture and the language and the beliefs of its day. Just as 20th, now 21st century Christian apologists speak to the atheist evolutionary worldview. And we use its language and we use its concepts and then we critique them in order to demonstrate that, well, there's more than just the possibility of a God. A God is probable. In fact, a logical requirement. No, I always look at the mythology of the other worldviews as being satanic or uh, misleading lies mm -hmm. of, of evil, and that they're judged by God. Judged I, I would agree to you to an extent. We do not believe what the Mesopotamians believe regarding their gods, nor their prehistory. What we do believe, and they believe, is that there is a ruling divinity over the world uh, and the nations, and that there really were angel beings that were ruling over the nations, and that there really are spirits who mess with human events and history. Yeah, we believe that too. As Christians. Yeah, so uh, we do not believe the details of their mythology any more than we believe the details of some other Christian theologies. For example, that Jesus left the world in charge of Peter and his um, appointees. That's baloney, in my opinion. But I do believe that Jesus Christ is still in charge of the world. All right, the Nephilim. Here's one passage in which the word occurs two times. And what I wanted to demonstrate is that uh, both places where the term Nephilim occurs, one of them is spelled with a little letter at the end of the green arrow, right there, called the Yod, or what in the Old English was called a jot. When Jesus said not one jot nor tittle would be lost, when the, sec when the word is used a second time over here, that jot is missing, all right? But it's the same word. But the point we're making here is two different ways to spell it. Now there's probably a reason for which it's missing from the second one, and that is that was the last word of the first clause of the sentence, which in Hebrew has a special accent mark and would tend to shorten the word. 
It took me a while to figure out that you're supposed to read this from right to left instead of left to right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. It made no sense reading right to left. <laughs> to left. Okay, I keep forgetting that. Not that I do that in Hebrew, but we did it every day in Arabic. All right, um, so the Nephilim are working hypothesis. These are called giants in most Bible translations, which is the plural form of an Aramaic word, Nephilim with an Hebrew ending on it. And it's not the Hebrew word nafal, which means to fall. So some of your Bibles and preachers will tell you the Nephilim, oh, that just means the fallen ones. Well, fallen from what? Doesn't make sense to begin with. Or, no, it says right there, they were mighty men of old. That means they, they were warriors, and they fell upon people to kill them. Well, that's just... That's making stuff up. Anyway, your, uh, the book explains how this term was developed, how it came into being, and why it meant giants in Aramaic, and why, therefore, that's why the Aramaic-speaking translators of the Greek Old Testament translated it giants. So, in the Second Temple period, <coughs> These were believed to be the giant offspring of the rebellious sons of God, as explained in the book of Enoch, which you should be reading. First 16 chapters of Enoch in particular, which won't take you more than 15 or 20 minutes. So, the Septuagint, which we are termed for the Greek Old Testament, in the, from the 3rd century BC, Jews translated the Old Testament into Greek, calling the Nephilim in Greek gigantes, from the word giga, which means big, huge, giant, gross, enormous. Gigabits. <laughs> right. So, of course, everyone's asking, well, just how big were they? Well, probably meaning more than six feet or six and a half feet, or about two meters in height, uh, which was unusually tall in, in antiquity when the average height was something over five feet, just by measuring skeletons, thousands of skeletons from around the world. Now, where did they come from? Who are these Nephilim? Were they really as big as depicted in this painting? In other words, about twice the size of the humans? Oh, who knows? Well, first, let's look at the supernatural theory of their origin, that these were divine beings who belonged in the sky or in the heavens. Now, in, we've mentioned this before. Where does the sky start? At the ground level, going up. That's the air. In fact, the New Testament talks about the spirit beings who dwell in the air, whereas other passages say heavens, or which is just a poetic word for sky. And so, uh, any event, they left their sky existence for a human one. And then some of these divine beings came down to earth, meaning they, they left their strictly spiritual existence to express themselves physically. That is, they assumed human flesh. Now, don't ask me the metaphysics or the mechanics of doing that. <laughs> I have no idea. So the, uh, and then they cohabited with human women. And they fathered unusually big offspring. <laughs> May have been male and female uh, Nephilim. They might have started having Nephilim children, but they did include the mighty men of renown, whoever those were. Greeks will tell you, oh, those were the titans, the giants. And so, we do have this phenomenon of giant clans or tribes who were in the land of Canaan when the Hebrews arrived there centuries later. Now, Jesus did say angels in heaven do not marry, but, but at the point he was making that in the resurrection, when we shall be divinized, glorified, we will no longer marry. In fact, we won't even be married. Well, they're also incapable of reproduction. So, uh, the spirit beings. Yeah, so the question is, uh, one of the questions, were they spirit beings reproducing themselves, especially in the garden where they were dwelling with Yahweh, watching him and giving, applauding him 
while he was creating the human beings. Uh, I was reading some in the, the book of Enoch and some in the reversing permanent. Right. And the explanation they gave is it says there that they do not marry. No, it doesn't say that they cannot. Yes, he does make that point. And um, it's a good one to make. However, if someone say, well, that's just quibbly over words. We want some concepts as well. Um, but why would they need to? <laughs> They're immortal and they don't need to reproduce. Unless they were fulfilling God's command to all of the all of the creatures, all of the creatures to reproduce and fill the earth. All right, we can leave that speculation aside for a moment. Talk about these divine beings who assumed humanity. In fact, there are several instances of this mentioned in scripture. First one, when Yahweh himself came, met with Abraham at his tent, in hum came in human form, ate a meal with Abraham, talked with Abraham, and argued with Abraham. So, and we're told in the text, that's who he was. Then, or you tell me, what are some other examples? Jesus. Or, or, yes, Jesus is one. We'll come around to him. Well, you just, yeah, with, with Lot, the angels held Lot back or brought him back into the house yes. to keep him escal escalating the situation outside the house. Exactly. I think it says they laid their hands on him and yeah. dragged him inside. So that would have had to have been physical. There's another part in that, in that section where it talks where the angels came down and appeared before the disciples to slap them to wait to to wake them. Yes. All right. Jacob wrestled with a man who was an angel. When you compare the Genesis account with the book of Hosea, it is explained he wrestled with God. Uh, what I did not mention here was when the young Samuel was asleep in the uh, tabernacle, it says Yahweh came and stood at the foot of his bed and talked to him. What stood? All right, angels physically touched Peter and woke him up when he was in prison and conducted him outside. And, and then Peter suddenly realized these guys who had wakened him by slapping him on the side, he said he suddenly realized, hey, this really happened. This wasn't only a dream. So it was not a dream appearance. And then God assumed human flesh by his own incarnation as Jesus. The Word was God, and God became flesh, and dwelt among us, the Son of God, revealing the glory of the Father. All right? What? All right. There are some differing theories, however, about uh, how this happened, or who these guys were. One says that these divine beings, angels if you wish, assumed human flesh, mated with women, and fathered offspring. All right, that, that's the view we've just seen, and which many believe is the biblical belief. But then there are those who suggest that these divine beings appeared to be human, but, all, but used the supernatural means to engender the offspring. So just as Yahweh conceived Jesus in Mary without intercourse, he supernaturally did it. The angel said to Mary, that which will be in you will come from the Holy Spirit, who is in no way human. So maybe that's what it was, some kind of magical trickery. A third position is that the divine beings used natural means to cause pregnancies <clears throat> by parthenogenesis, meaning, well, they really could not mate in a physical sense, you know, so they used science. What was the name of that sheep who was... Dolly. Dolly, Dolly yes. Parthenogenesis means born of a virgin. Parthenos means virgin. And so these guys were scientists. They, they knew what to do. And some suggest that's what the flying saucers are doing. Those are uh, Nephilim flying around the world <laughs> causing women to get pregnant. All right. Then fourthly, some say, well, the divine beings already had bodies, so they are able to mate with human beings. But you don't always see their bodies unless they choose to become visible. And if you are a divine being, 
you can be invisible or visible to human beings, depending on your purposes. And so, if you ever go work in India, it would be kind of fascinating because over there, they actually will tell you that there are spirits who take human form and live amongst us, and you should, you better be polite to everybody. Sounds like a Bible thing. Mm -hmm. Angels unaware. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a biblicist, I could not entirely disagree with them. So, how tall were they? That's tall enough to be seen. All right. Human height is one of those characteristics that falls into a normal curve. And if you <laughs> go into any population and measure everybody, they fit the normal curve. So you always have a few very short people and some extraordinarily tall ones come height. So Matt here is like a Bethel. <laughs> He's uh, approaching, yes, the limits, the upper limits. Anyway, <clears throat> we call this the normal distribution. Archaeologists have gone around measuring skeletons around the world, and they find a similar distribution amongst ancient societies. Had some very tall folk. Uh, the Bible itself mentions an Egyptian in cubits who would therefore have been about seven and a half feet tall unusually tall. In fact, someone that high, we usually say they have a condition called gigantism, which is that same Greek word. Goliath was four and a half cubits tall. However, if in the King James Version, he is said to be six and a half cubits tall. Why the discrepancy? Well, the Masoretic text, the received Hebrew text, of which, the oldest of which was 10th century AD until the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered, it actually says six, and a, six cubits and a span. But when the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, this same passage reads in the oldest Hebrew, four cubits and a span. So these guys were probably six and a half feet taller, maybe very muscular. In any event, they were apparently dangerous guys. The question is how long did they live? because we know that bodybuilders, these really strong muscular guys who we see in pictures, few of them ever lived beyond age 50 because the stress that they put on their bodies eventually causes a cardiovascular illness. There are also people with a genetic deformity such as Andre the Giant yes. that they never ever completely stop growing. Right. And they typically die of heart failure. And that's the condition we call gigantism. All right, now some say, well, wait a minute, August bed. He was he said in the Bible to have been an Anakim, descended from the Nephilim, and his bed was oh, 19 cubits long, very long bed. However, uh, when archaeologists found the original uh, Tower of Babel and which still exists, a good part of it, and they found the clay tablets associated with it, we learned that the god Marduk had a cultic bed where he and the goddess would once a year do whatever was necessary to cause crops to grow. And it's the exact measurements of his bed. And so all probably was not 13 feet long or tall, though his bed was. In other words, he was using a godlike bed. Yeah, a king. A king. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Something like that. Others say, well, the word bed here means a sarcophagus. It's talking about his coffin. So there's like a California king, and then there's like a Marduk king. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely after the flood. Where did they come from? For example, Goliath, who fought with little David. Well, the Bible says Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterwards, assuming it means after the flood. Uh, when the spies went into Canaan and came back out and gave the report, they said, we saw the Nephilim. Well, they saw the Anakites, who were from the Nephilim. Joshua, we read that none of the Anakim was left in the land of the Israelites, though some remained only in Gaza, Gath, and Ashdod, and their gods, who rule in Gaza to this day, by the way. Okay, so Goliath, he was from Gath, so he was legitimately called, being an Anakim, a Nephilim at the same time. But I would just like to suggest five theories as it 
and let you apply your own logic. Anyway, amongst the Dead Sea Scrolls was a document that has come to be called the Genesis Apocryphon. <clears throat> In other words, an apocryphal book of Genesis. And it is the book of Genesis, but with some important differences. Eventually, it was unrolled and has been deciphered or translated. The possibility of a local flood, which allowed some humans and Nephilim to survive, although the majority of those living in that part of the world perished in this really big local flood in which Noah and his family were saved. That's not what the scriptural text. Well, it says all the earth. The problem is the Ares. The term Ares also translates the land, or the country, or the place. And therefore, when it says, our Bible say the whole earth, remember, the folk back in those days had no concept of the earth as a planet. They only had a concept of the earth as the ground we stand on, or the territory we live in. So we have our land, you have your land. And so it could have been a local flood, but it was really a serious one. Uh, just as two of every creature were taken into the ark, the Nephilim being creatures, two of them went on as well and reproduced normally after the flood, becoming the Anakim clans or tribes. That explains that. Others suggest that Noah or a member of his family was part Nephilim. Here's where this uh, Genesis of Apocryphon comes in. It recounts Noah having an argument with his uh, parents and his wife about whether she or he or they were part Nephilim. And of course, he denies it categorically. Others suggest the sons of God who sinned before the flood, they went to hell. But there are other sons of God who still float around in the sky to this day. And maybe they decided to commit the same sin by finding some willing women and procreating Nephilim with them uh, in Canaan and any place else in the world where you would find a tall tribe. And then the Israelite spies were mistaken about the Anakim, believing them to be descended from the Nephilim, but they weren't. Or, as others suggest, well, Nephilim, the translated giant, was just the Hebrew word for giant, and so all the spies were really saying was that, hey, there are giants in the land, which our Bible translators decided to call Nephilim, which then in our mind connects them back to the pre-flood giants. And so, the, so we try to explain things that never happened. Now, if any of these theories uh, suits your needs, why well, you can adopt it. All right, your assignment, guys, for next time. Read chapter 2 in Reversing Hermon and read the first 16 chapters in the book of Enoch, please. Uh, if, you, if you forget, we do have a website.